Okay, good. This is on. All right, so I'm really excited to have, whoop, to have a chance to talk about this. Um, I taught there for two years, taught in a school that was American school. That means they learned everything you learned, but 90% of the kids were from Bahrain or Egypt or the area, okay? Um, everybody spoke English, had a great experience. While I was there, when I went there, it was a period of peace that had been going on for 15 years and completely lowest crime rates ever. It would have been more dangerous to go teach in Chicago than it would be for me to go to the Middle East. So that's why I told my parents. So. Now I'm going to be sharing with you, when I went there, something called the Arab Spring happened. Maybe you've heard about all the protests in Egypt and in um, Syria and all that good stuff. So let's just start with what is Bahrain. Uh, Bahrain is a tiny little country in the Persian Gulf connected to Saudi Arabia by a bridge. Um, it consists of 33 islands that have been filled in together with sand and sort of made to be larger and more connected. Um, it's a pretty wealthy country. It did have oil at one time, but it ran out of oil and um, started. they started doing a lot of banking and made a lot of money. Whoops, what am I doing? Okay, so you can see that it's tiny. Can I go back? Yeah. Um, you see here's Saudi Arabia, and then there's Qatar. That little, it looks like the size of my thumb. This tiny dot here is Bahrain. It's about the size of a county. I could drive from, maybe it's better if I just talk. You can put it around your neck. Does this work? Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Um, we, could drive the, we could drive from north to south in 45 minutes. So when I got over there, I was like, what have I done? This country is tiny. Oh my gosh. Okay, so there it is. Um, and Manama is where I lived. All this other stuff, pretty small. Okay, um, my neighborhood was called Jufair, and it was built only in the last maybe five years because it used to be ocean. And so you can see all these construction cranes, there was constant buildings going up all the time. Okay, that's the Grand Mosque, that's like one of the most expensive mosques in the world. They spent millions of dollars on it, and uh, my head is right there, you can't really see it. Um, when you go into the mosque, if you're female, you need to cover your hair and you need to cover down to your arms and not have your legs showing. Um, and so the head covering that we're wearing, there's me there, uh, that's called a hijab, okay? It's not a burqa, it's not the same thing as a burqa. Uh, the word hijab is a concept that means modesty. So women who are Muslim get to choose, do they want to wear a, head, a headscarf? Do they want to cover themselves? And it's their choice. And it also depends on their family. So if their family is really conservative, there might be some pressure for them to wear the headscarf. But a lot of families, it's whenever they're ready to pick it, then they, they choose to wear it. Some girls will start wearing it when they're a teenager. Others will wait until they're 30 years old, maybe even 40. Um, but when you're in the mosque, you always cover your head. And so, and then the robe is called an abaya. I didn't have to wear it anywhere except in a mosque. Other than that, I could dress however I wanted. There's a really nice chandelier in the mosque. The call to prayer. So they pray five times a day, and the times are here. So starting, um, I believe, so this is actually four in the morning, not four in the afternoon. So they get up at four in the morning, pray, go back to sleep. Then they pray again at about 7.35. Then again, wait, no, I can't read it. But it is five times a day spread out throughout the day. So that's a daily thing here. That is people praying in the mosque. I don't know if you can see too well. Okay, other things to do in Bahrain, you could go to the souk. That's the uh, market that you might see from the movie Aladdin or Indiana Jones, where there's all these fabrics and everybody's yelling, buy this, buy that. Uh, very exciting, fun to go there. That's the souk. Uh, Bahrain has Formula One racing, which is sort of the world version of NASCAR. So every year, people from all over the world come to race their cars. They, they were going to have Taylor Swift come and sing, but then the protests happened, and she got freaked out and didn't come. So very interesting. Uh, another great thing was the camels. You got to go visit the camels for free anytime. And I never had the heart to try the camel sausage because they're just too cute. So they're adorable. And they like to eat grass. All right, other things, it's a very indoor culture because it's so hot, there's no real, there's not gardens really anywhere except maybe by, you know, some water, 
So it's very dry. So it's very much all about where can we have beauty? Well, we can have beauty in our architecture and our buildings. So you can see how really unique that building is. All the buildings there were really beautiful and interesting and because they spent most of their time indoors. And they would go to the mall all the time because there wasn't a lot outside. There's my students. So they're really adorable and uh, just funny kids. They all had their Blackberries, their iPhones. They were obsessed with Justin Bieber. I mean, the similarities between the two, you know, between you and them, a lot of similarities. They loved all the same movies um, that you guys see and um, really had a lot of good times. Okay, and you can see how small the classrooms are. Okay, this was one of the richest schools in the country. And you can see how close they're sitting together. So you guys, I mean, how you're sitting now is practically how crowded it was in my classroom. So you have really good, you, you're very lucky. Um, there's just a view of some buildings at night. Can't really see these pictures. Uh, this was the view out of my window for the first six months that I lived, lived there. And this is where we're gonna get into nationalism. Because you might notice this building here has some sort of weird red stuff you can't really see. This is a huge building. On the side of this building, well, we'll go back to that. This is a picture of the king, the king's father, and the king's grandfather on the side of the building. Huge. So it would be like driving down the street and seeing Barack Obama, like a huge poster on the side of the building. Yes? So it's basically like, um, uh, it's like his family, it's like his family tree going down the side of the building? Kind of. Just pictures to remind you who's in charge. Like his like, like his family going down the train, the yes. grandfather, father, son, and then son and daughter, and they passed down. The well, family. just fathers, sadly. A little bit sexist, so men were kings, women didn't really. So what is that, how does that relate to what is nationalism? Nationalism is feelings of extreme and excessive pride of your country. Uh, basically, you believe your country is better than all other countries, and uh, if you have a king, it can get awkward, because... They're in charge, so you better love them, right? Especially if King's workers are around. So almost every business that you would go into, if you're going to go and get some McDonald's, there would be a huge picture of the King in McDonald's. Because what if the King came by and there wasn't a picture? It could be awkward for that business owner. So yeah, these pictures everywhere of the King. Um, oh, other quick thing. They were really into the mall culture, so they have over-the-top malls. I threw that in for fun. Okay, this is the tree of life. It's one of the only trees in the desert, and so it's become a tourist attraction. Yes, our, the one tree in their country is a tourist attraction. That's how little vegetation there is. Okay, um, and then last thing is uh, Dubai. That's in the United Arab Emirates. Different country, same area. If you have a lot of money, you can afford to do cool things. This is an indoor skiing hill in a mall. So kids who have never got to see snow in their lives, if they go to Dubai, they can go skiing. And you just you rent your coat, you rent your boots. And so if, you, if you're a country that has a lot of money, you can afford to do these things. All right, so now we're going to get into sort of the darker side. This was all the fun stuff. Um, February 14th, 20, let's just say 2010, sorry. Uh, this is known as the Day of Rage. This was when the Arab Spring started in Bahrain. I'll explain why. Okay, so you guys have heard about the term Shia Sunni, right? Okay, so for those of you who haven't, let's just break it down. Um, in Christianity, if you are Protestant and you're Catholic, do you believe in the same God? Yep. Do you read the same book? Yep. Uh, the differences are just the way you practice it, right? Where you go, some of the things you do, but you believe the same thing. So Shia and Sunni is the same. They both believe in the same God. They read the same book. They believe a lot of the same things, but they're two slightly different groups, okay? The problem is if you're Shia and you live in Bahrain, you don't really have equal rights, even though you're the majority of the population. So she, being Shia in Bahrain, there's 70% of the population, but there are only 14 Shia in the parliament, which it has 40 people. So that's not fair. If it was equal, there would be a lot more of them in the parliament. So if you're Shia, you're not a citizen. You can't work for the military or for the government. You can't get a lot of the best jobs because they'll just look at your name and they know, oh, that's a Shia name. They won't hire you. They won't even interview you. Um, and you end up usually living in a poorer village, so you, your kids don't go to as nice of a school. It's really not good. 